and yep, then recording. mute all. You can spell it, yeah. 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 And yeah. allow participants yeah. to unmute. Uh, no, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there we are. Well, let's get cracking. And uh, the, the, I, I, a few a few weeks ago, I gave uh, two two hour talks to my uh, Leatherhead art class, which I've been running here for about eight or nine years. Got a very faithful group that come uh, that come. And, and in in lockdown, we've been doing uh, we've been doing uh, Zoom. And uh, so I did two hour talks on uh, the exhibition at the National Gallery. And what I've tried to do today. Okay, see, yeah. Is to uh, is to um, it, it, it to condense them into like uh, one uh, one talk. I've still got I've got uh, I've got one or two people who are I have I'm muted sorry. I've muted everybody, but I've got people uh, allow people to unmute. Shouldn't be able to. I turned it off. Should be mm -hmm. if I, if. if there's something wrong with the muting, but really, I have unmuted you all, and uh, I have I have muted you all. Sorry. No, so uh, there we are. Okay, so um, let's get down. Let's get that for. Oh, so so what I've done is to condense it, and it's uh, uh, if you've been to the exhibition, you will have noticed that it's very bare. It's it's very. Um, it's very sparse. I've got more people coming on, excuse me, sorry. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a very, it's very sparse. It's a single room, well, but, but there, there are two anti-rooms, if you like. One is a, a room you go through to have your ticket checked again. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the, 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 the other is a, a small room with, with a few bits of inf inf information on the wall and uh, some kind of semi-transparent banners hanging with the paintings you're going to see. They look like negatives of those paintings in a way. And you go inside and you're in a single room and it is an absolute miracle to walk in there and see seven paintings that have had such, such uh, a history and have come together for um, the first time in, in, in Yonks, let's just say. In fact, one of them in there, the last painting we'll see, which is the National Gallery's um, Death, of, Death of Action. Uh, that, that, that was never a, a, a painting that Philip II received. All the six, these poesia, these, these, these poems, if you like, as they're called, that Titian did for Philip II, they are all united Again, they're all there together again, and uh, they—you um, could actually study their travels where they've been. I've got a whole list here of places that they've been to, and only one of the paintings will I go into to show you uh, where it's been and to whom it belonged, and uh, and so on. I've got somebody else now coming in. Excuse me, and uh, I'll just say this: that really, the, the, these the paintings we're going to see, and I'll run through the seven of them very quickly first before going on to some background these paintings uh, they were they were commissioned by a young philip ii he was only about 21 when he started to uh, to have paintings sent to him from titian and titian himself was a a, a very mature artist titian was in his early 60s and uh, and uh, and it, and the the paintings are the fruit of a, a collaboration in which um, philip Philip simply gave free reign to Titian as to the subjects of the following <coughs> that he would uh, he would paint. Um, what happened to paintings after? A, a couple of details that may interest you actually. One is that when Philip the Third, Philip the Third comes on the throne, he has these rather erotic paintings uh, placed in a particularly private space at the Alcazar. That's the Alcázar in Madrid, the old Alcázar, Alcázar, that was replaced by the Palacio del Oriente in the 18th century. And he had them placed there because of their erotic character. And it's recorded in an, annot it's an annotation in uh, a certain Spanish artist's copy of Vasari's Lives of the Artists, which of course Titian has mentioned. The artist in question was Luis Tristan. It's recorded there by Luis Tristan in a margin that His Majesty, that's Philip III, wishes them kept apart to, I've got a bit of interference again, if somebody's moving around, I have tried to mute you all 
Um, it's uh, His Majesty wishes them kept apart to uh, uphold his modesty and great virtue. Um, okay. D -d 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 this. Okay. Sorry. All right. So that that's just like, like like a little preamble. Of course, there's Philip the Fourth. What happened to Philip the Fourth and these paintings? Did any of you ever see a film? Now, was it back in the nineties? It was called, uh, I only saw a clip of it actually. It's called El Rey Pasmado, which I suppose you might translate as the, the gobsmacked king. And if you imagine being gobsmacked and you already have the Habsburg jaw. Well, in a way, that's how I remember Philip IV uh, as a very young king being portrayed uh, as he went down this store in the Alcazar somewhere and he discovered, he discovered paintings by Titian erotic paintings, including the ones that we, uh, we are going to see. And then at some point, he had them, uh, he had them, uh, they were covered in this section, they were covered in the clip of the film. He's walking through and he's, un he's uncovering the veils, which, uh, to reveal these what pictures. Happened, and, he's, and he's absolutely, um, he's absolutely um, he is kind of taken by these. And it's recorded that he, he has them placed in, a certain apartment, a certain area of the Madrid Alcázar, where he goes. Where, where, there are people talking in the background, and if, if, I've tried to mute you, but really, it's um, I don't know what's happened really. But if no, you could really. no, maybe really mute yourselves, please. Everybody mute themselves, please. And uh, so Philip, Philip would go of an afternoon for his siesta into a room full of Titians. In this, this sensuous, these sensuous paintings, but of course, including uh, in a famous Titian painting of the Adam and Eve, the fall of man, really. The fall of man. That's uh, included down there as well. So let's get let's get cracking and just uh, just run through the um, just run through the um, the paint. Just give you sorry, my uh, I'm just uh, yeah. Moving one, there we are. There, there they are. There they are. That's the single room of the gallery uh, in which they're placed. And the door there on the right. If you go to the exhibition, go through there, and you are into the uh, you're into the the high Renaissance. And you will, as you walk through that door, you will be confronted by an earlier Titian, quite different in style than the uh, the earlier Titian. Quite a lithid, beautiful, almost like enamel-like uh, technique, really, of of Dionysius meeting Ariadne on Naxos. So you go from this to earlier Titian, and you're faced with the uh, more mm. uh, more uh, mythology. And you right. stand in the middle of this room. You you walk around, and everywhere you have uh, flesh. Uh, and you have. Um, uh, you have uh, female, you have female flesh, and this is the point at which I uh, I uh, apologise for looking at the world from the point of view the, of the male gaze. This is very much the male gaze, which would not at all uh, uh, please um, many, many, like you might yeah. say, feminists, whatever. Today, you know, it, it, it's it's a man and it's a royal guy, the royal king Philip II, who is uh, got another mission here now. Uh, it's his gaze, it's a royal gaze, it's a royal gaze for his kind of private consumption or those he is uh, he is intimate with. And so you have this display of flesh and in each painting somewhere, you'll get kind of, you'll get a, a flying piece of drapery or maybe it could be the uh, Diana's spot or something, you know. But you 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 have this red everywhere, and the red the red it's the red is is suggestive it's suggestive of uh, of, uh, of passion. Um, sorry, I, I'm sorry to harp on, but I've got people talking in the background, and it's it's difficult to concentrate. If you, I, I've, I have really tried to unmute you, but if you could unmute yourselves and uh, just not speak if you can't, please, I, I'd be ever so grateful. Ever so grateful. Paul, Paul, hi, it's Justin here. Um, yeah, it, in particular, I think it's um, uh, a, a subscriber called Carolyn. If Carolyn could put her okay, iPad you. on to mute. Yeah. Um, we have two other people still not on mute. Yeah. Taylor and Judy Legg, in fact, sorry, three. 
Kate Taylor, yeah. Julie, Judy Legg and Jan Fielden. If you could each put yourselves onto mute, please, that would be most appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Mute. Thank you. Mute. <laughs> That, Sorry, that, 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 no, no worries, but we, we, it, we, it, it should be there should be a button at the bottom left of your screen, Kate. I think you're the only okay. one left now. Okay, is it okay? No, because I can still hear you. <laughs> uh, yeah, what should you do? Um, oh, mute, mute. Yeah, it's so it should be at the bottom left of your Zoom screen. Zoom screen, bottom. Uh, no, I bottom. Bottom uh, left, yeah. Left, left. No, I think. Okay, you may be. But on anyway, I'll be quiet. <laughs> okay. I think if, if you can't, if you can't mute, then just be quiet. That would that be the best solution, I think, really. You okay. Know. So, okay. Thank yeah, you. No, left. Hmm. It's okay, no. I don't know. As, as long as you keep quiet. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Oh. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. We we'll. Uh, okay. We'll we'll. Uh, We'll carry on then. Okay, so there it is. There's there's the room, and, and uh, the, the the paintings have I think all the more impact, all the more impact for being placed together with uh, no distractions. I must say I, I walked in there imagining to see like preparatory works, similar works, background on the, on, on, on Philip, maybe a portrait of Philip or something. But no, it's just the seven paintings, and and it's absolutely wonderful. And so you can feel like Philip the Fourth entering that kind of place in the Alcazar and discovering these. Now, they, I'll just give you one example of a place, one of the places where they, some of them used to hang. It's this here. This is the, down, you, this is <coughs> Paris, you recognize Paris. You can see, I've got somebody else now admitting, okay. You can see down there, you can see the Louvre and down in front of us is the, uh, is the, the Palais Royal, the Palais Royal which was originally built by um, Cardinal Richelieu and went to uh, Louis XIV after his death. And it eventually came into the, uh, a few years le later, later, into the, uh, the, the hands of Le Grand Monsieur, that's Louis' brother, who was the father of this guy. This is uh, Philippe. This is Philippe, uh, the, the second Duke of Orléans the second Duke of Orléans. And he amassed in the Palais Royal one of the most fabulous collections of European art you could possibly imagine. And the story of its dispersal is something else I've, I've, spoken, I've spoken on recently. But just to say today that there's one of the original owners of some of those paintings. I think, uh, in fact, Diana and Callisto and uh, Diana and Action, and, 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 and they, they, they were, uh, they were, um, they were in a gallery, in a gallery, a whole enfilade of rooms in the Palais Royal, and he, he loved Italian art, the, the Italian arts of the 16th and even particularly 17th century, and uh, and that's that, that's where they were they were ex exhibited, a kind of, uh, and he was regent of France, and uh, and some say he's building up this collection in case he became king to have his own. Great uh, collection. So that's just one, one of the one of the owners of the paintings, uh, Philip, Second Duke of Orléans. And now we come on to the theme. Here we come on to uh, to uh, to Titian <coughs> himself. And we're not quite sure when he was born, but he died in uh, 1876, probably early 80s. And uh, which is a, a really really it's a ripe old age for. Uh, for uh, an artist, and here he is around uh, around sixty, and this is about sixty plus because we don't know his date of birth. But really, this is a, the mature, successful artist. It, it's almost as if he's portrayed himself as a a, a Venetian senator. So he certainly looks aristocratic, and uh, the, he, he was he, his patron before Philip uh, was Charles V, Philip's father. We're coming on to, and the legend is that. Uh, uh, Charles V had such a regard for Titian that when he was in his studio one day, and that was probably in Augsburg, where Titian went a couple of times to paint for the emperor, uh, that the, Charles V bent and he stooped to the floor and picked up Titian's, uh, uh, and he said toothbrush, paintbrush, picked up his uh, paintbrush and uh, and that's, and he made him, Charles made him a, an equus, a knight of the Holy Roman Emperor, gave him a golden chain, and so this is Titian, who's he's achieved 
the beau, the beau ideal of the Renaissance artist, which is to be valued on the same level somehow as intellectuals and whatever, not just a craftsman, but Titian has really made it. And this is the, this is the man that um, Philip is so anxious to meet when he's only about 20, 21 years old. He's still a prince. He's not yet married uh, the Queen of England, Queen Mary, we'll come on to her. So that's Philip. Um, that's uh, that's uh, a, a Philip by, by Titian. It's in the, uh, in, in the Prado, uh, in which Titian is really demonstrating his great, his versatility. Titian can pa paint anything, any surface, any surface. And as he, as he moves on, as he moves on, his, his technique becomes a lot, a lot looser. And he's almost, uh, he's almost really uh, foretelling what's going to come later on with Velasquez and then later Manet and the, and the Impressionists. But here he's, he's painted this armor in this very knitted way. And if you look at, um, if you look at uh, Philip's um, cod piece, that's, that's very much, that, 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 that's very much what these Renaissance rulers did. They showed, they showed off their manhood and pity Philip, and I just pity Philip as an adolescent receiving this, uh, this kind of advice on sex from his father. He's only in his teens, about 17. And he writes to Philip from, he's got, Charles has gone to the Netherlands. So he writes to Philip, having left him in the care of tutors. We're all clerics and humanists, really, you know. But um, when you look at the poesie, remember this. The... Uh, the, um, this is from this is from the life of Philip II by Geoffrey Parker, and here is Charles speaking to his or writing to his son Philip. Inasmuch as you are of young and tender age, and I have no other son, and I do not wish to have others, it is very important that you restrain your desires, and do not make excessive efforts at this early stage, which could lead to physical damage because apart from the fact that it can be dangerous, both for the body's growth and for its strength, it can often lead to such weakness that it interferes with conceiving children and even causes death, as it did with Prince Juan of Trastamara, that's the Principe Juan who was buried in a gorgeous uh, Renaissance tomb in, uh, in Avila. So there we are, there, there's Charles um, speaking to his son and then, uh, Philip marries quite young, the, uh, a princess of Portugal, and uh, he goes to his wedding dressed in white. And here is Charles giving advice on Philip and his wife's company. You must be very restrained when you're on your wife's company. And since that is somewhat difficult, the solution is to keep you away from her as much as possible. And so I require and request that once you have consummated the marriage, you plead some illness and keep away from her and do not visit her again so quickly or so often. And when you do return, let it be for only a short while. And the author, the historian uh, Parker's verdict on this is, it's hard to imagine a situation more likely to create a serious complex about sex in a 15 year old boy. So just bear, bear that in mind when you're, Looking at these, uh, at these, um, these, these myths, these, uh, these sensuous paintings that he did for uh, Philip. There's Charles V at Muhlberg. You all know that. That's that, that's that, that's what uh, uh, Titian was capable of in portraiture. He's a fabulous portraitist, as you know. You know all this. And there's the there is uh, that there, there, there is that wonderful celebration of Charles uh, attempting to solve the problem of the breakup of Christendom in Germany at a Battle of uh, Mühlberg in, um, in, in 1547, that was. And this is painted in 1548 by Titian. And there it is. Now, Titian mainly did, mainly did um, uh, portraits for Charles, but Philip, the young Philip knew of what Titian could do. And uh, so, um, and, and, Titian, and so what Titian does for Charles, for, for, for Philip in the end, is the mythologies, but they give way, they give way to religious paintings. By the end, Titian is, is painting purely religious paintings for, uh, for Philip. Um, when in, 
December 1548, it's not a very good image, I'm sorry, but in December 1548, uh, uh, Philip goes with an enormous train to uh, Milan, and uh, there, and Titian is summoned there to meet him. He wants to meet Titian for um, the first time. And Philip's on a tour of his uh, Habsburg dominions, because at this, this stage, uh, Charles V, his policy is really, if he can get Philip to inherit the Holy Roman Empire, as he did, that would be a nice thing, but that doesn't happen, that's a long story. So uh, this, is just a, this is just an example of the temporary architecture that the artists will be required to do for uh, triumphal entries into a city. And I'm preempting here, but this is, this is a triumphal, uh, a tri a triumphal uh, entry into, I think it was Antwerp for Philip, after he meets Titian, by the way. And it's got Philip in the middle. It's very vague with a suggestion of protection and divine, divine protection and so on, and very much in the Renaissance spirit. But let's go to um, this image here. This is mentioned in Parker's, um, in Parker's um, biography. Uh, the, the guy in the black could be Philip II. This could be Philip after his metician. Uh, in, uh, in, I think, again, I think in Antwerp. And it's called a joust in a city square, 1549. By that stage, he's, he's reached the, 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 the Netherlands. And uh, the guy in, on the left, in red, he's got the very Catalan name of Don Luis de Recasens. And, uh, and Recasens knocks Philip off his horse. And uh, Philip is knocked to the ground, stunned. And if I mention that detail, it's to emphasize on the face of this image of Philip, the, uh, the guy in black at the end of his life, really saying the rosary in, the, in those portraits. This is a young man, we're looking at a young man here, uh, commissioning from Titian, the kind of things that a young man would li might like on his, uh, on his walls. And it shows us also Philip's love of uh, chivalry and action. Yeah. I remember at this stage, of course, Henry VIII, uh, a bit earlier, of course, with Henry, Henry VIII is a great, uh, is a great, um, a great jouster, really. So, so Philip, I'm not going back slightly a few months, Philip and Philip and Titian meet in Milan here in a strategic city that not very long, not long previous to this encounter, a few years had come into the Habsburg, uh, under Habsburg rule. And it's a kind of, uh, it's a hub really, or one of the hubs of the empire. And uh, Philip meets, Titian's here and starts getting to know him and then in early January uh, Philip starts making his way to Flanders uh, over the Alps via perhaps via, via um, Augsburg and uh, so on this journey he's got a 500 strong retinue and among them Titian and Titian's uh, one of his sons and his assistants. And, and one imagines that during that journey, during this time, Philip and Titian are getting to know each other and they are maybe discussing the kind of things that Philip, that, that Philip would like uh, Titian to, um, to, to do. And later there's another, later that 1549, then there's another meeting in Augsburg with Titian. So there we are. There's the, there's the Holy Roman Empire, there's Milan, there's the, there's the empire that Charles wanted for Philip. Okay, now I'm coming on to Ovid. Um, Ovid, Ovid, uh, Ovid the poet, the metamorphoses, uh, muting microphones uh, reminds me of mutants and mutants reminds one of, uh, makes one think of metamorphosis which of course is a change into something else, a change into something else. And Ovid, as you know, and I've already dipped into it in English, by the way, Ovid wrote these gripping, I would say gripping, really in terms of capturing your attention, these gripping stories that almost run seamlessly into each other of gods transforming themselves into mortals. Maybe a god transforming uh, a crow that used to be white into some in, into a black bird, a black colored bird now, because it had been gossiping to punish, you know. It's all about the wantonness of the gods and, uh, and their fickleness. And at the same time, it's just a mirror held up to the, uh, 
the passions to human nature, if you like. And if I show you this image here of a Bernini, it's because it's a very graphic image, but what you, you, uh, you, you experience when you're reading, before you know it, when you're reading of it, uh, the, it's, um, it's, uh, the, the, the change is happening. You, 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 the change is happening before you realize what it is. And, and here it is with, uh, and the characters also, the characters like here, Daphne, and I'll talk about Action later. Action has been turned into a stag by Diana. And uh, he tries to cry out for help. But, but by that stage, all he can do is moan like a stag. He's lost his human voice. And, and Ovid is, is full of that. And Ovid does not kind of, um, doesn't spare us violence. It, it, it's, uh, it's a harsh world that he portrays. When he portrays Phaeton falling out of heaven, having persuaded Phoebus to let him ride the chariot of the sun all day. Uh, he, spares, he, spares no, he does not spare our feelings at all in describing the shattering chariot falling to the ground, etc., etc., etc. So there is a violence in Ovid. There's a theme of death running through uh, death, desire, love as well, of course. And that is what feeds into, uh, into Titian, as it did into other artists, one of whom I'm coming on to uh, in, uh, in a moment. Okay. There is a 17th century engraving of uh, Ovid and with the, the laurels of a poet. And then it's just a page from one of the translations. Several translations were done in the late 15th into the early 16th century, various editions uh, into Italian and, uh, and uh, Titian drew on one of these, in particular, I forget which one, but it doesn't matter because we're, we just want to know that he, he was inspired, among other things, but mainly by Ovid for these paintings he did for Philip. Give you an idea of the violence. Here is a rather primitive now looking um, for us illustration from one of the translations. It's the death of Orpheus, where uh, Orpheus is just being really pummeled to death. Just look at the violence in that with those clubs, really, and, and, and his body falling. Ovid is full of that he's just replete with um, this, this 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 world of vulnerability and fragility and being being at the mercy of the gods and if you think of Lear that, that line from uh, Lear as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods and I'm coming on now to some of the works some of the paintings that may have uh, that, that Philip would have known and would have been on his mind maybe, maybe when he was you know, thinking about getting stuff from uh, Titian. Uh, here, first of all, is a portrait by, um, by Titian of uh, Federico, Duke of, uh, Federico of, uh, Duke of Don Gonzaga, Duke of uh, Mantua, Federico Gonzaga, in this fabulous, fabulous portrait that you probably know from your visits to the Prado. And I looked at this once close up and the, this value in that blue, it's going to be lapis lazuli, you know, the, 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 the lovely blue pigment really, that it's just larded on, no expense spared for a Renaissance prince. And um, this prince, he gave the paintings I'm going to show you now to, um, to Charles V. And so, um, so Philip would have, would have, would have, we think would have, would have known these. And here's one of them. This, this one has ended up in, in Vienna. It's Correggio's uh, Ganymede. And here is Metamorphosis. Here's the Metamorphosis of Job, who spied, spies a beautiful, a beautiful boy, and he and he grabs him by the talons and he takes him up to, to heaven to be his, to Olympus, to be his cupbearer. And this, the boy here looks, he's got that look that we see later maybe on the face of Danae as she has been raped by a bull. He's got that look of uh, partly apprehensive, but partly enjoying the adventure. Because he, he's going up nice, you know, it's gonna be all right for him up in heaven. That's a, a metamorphosis going okay for the mortal, really. And we've got that, and then we've got Jupiter and uh, Jupiter and uh, and Io. Io was, um, Io, uh, Io was the, um, the, the e, 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 Io is another of these nymphs, and this time, uh, in order to disguise what he's doing from Juno, um, uh, Jove 
Zeus, he covers the whole valley in a cloud. And then he rapes, in the form of a cloud, he rapes Juno. And this is one of the most erotic, uh, for the race art, one, one of the most erotic paintings you could possibly sort of maybe, uh, maybe, uh, maybe see, even though it looks really rather odd. It's quite wacky, actually. The idea that some that's, there's a person in there, there's a god in there, really having his way with that big pet, that big bear paw, really. And then, uh, then we have the education of Cupid. The previous one is is in Vienna. This one is in the National Gallery. And this could this would quite easily be for its gentleness, and you know, it, it's kind of domesticity. This could be a, a holy family, but it's not. It's Mercury, Venus and Cupid. It's the education of Cupid. And, uh, and then Danai, this wonderful Danai, he did, uh, this is the Borghese Gallery in Rome. This is, um, this is, this, and I'll tell the story of Danai now, it'll save doing it later. Danai is the daughter of uh, Acrisius, king of Argos and of Eurydice. Now, this is where you, the gods will get their way in the end. You cannot avoid your fate. Uh, there's been a prophecy that the king of Argos would uh, be killed, would, would be the cause of, uh, of uh, Acrisius's death, really, uh, by her son. So in order, to, in order to prevent this, he shuts her up in a tower. And of course, Jupiter, he, uh, he gets through the roof, he gets to the window in the roof in the form of golden rain, really. And here is, uh, here is Cupid, uh, rather coyly, facilitating, uh, how could I put it, facilitating uh, Jupiter's entry, if you like. And a couple of nice little cheery cherubs down there on the right to, you know, to, to bring an element of playfulness into this. So this is the Correggio Danai. We will see, um, two, we will see um, Titian's version later. There we are, just move on with these. Uh, there's Eros as a, a go-between, really, a kind of go-between. And uh, we will see, instead of Eros later, uh, an old an old hag, really. When we come to that, see that. So th these are paintings that uh, Philip, we imagine, would have known. <coughs> then there are... Um, one or two things that uh, were done for um, his aunt, his aunt Mary, aunt Mary of Burgundy, who was briefly uh, queen of Hungary. She was a sister of his father. She was a sister of Charles V, who appointed her governor of uh, the Netherlands and a very stout, very doughty, reliable woman she was. And uh, peculiarly, she commissioned from Titian uh, some quite large, quite large, uh, uh, paintings of myths, myths, you know, the, the, these, the, these big guys here. And I'll just show you one of them. These were meant to decorate uh, uh, a hunting lodge um, in, in Flanders somewhere that she, she, she established. And here we have uh, Sisyphus. And um, I must say, when I first saw that, only in reproduction, I would hardly have thought it was Titian somehow. It could have been, well, I don't know, any, any other number of artists, but there it is, a Titian. And, and of course, it's a good example of how Titian convinces you of any subject. You're really in there with Sisyphus, that great burden that's weighing him down. He rolls up the rock to the top of the hill and then it rolls down. And that's his fate for all eternity. In uh, Genoa, on his travels, Philip, it is thought, would have, was, would have visited a, a palace a palace uh, which had just been built by Prince Andrea Doria as a place to show off, really, basically, and have big receptions and so on. And there was a, an Italian, Perino del Varga, who designed a whole, uh, a whole uh, gallery full of, uh, of, of tapestries showing the loves of the, the loves of the gods. And in this one here, we see Jupiter for a change, not out. Uh, seducing somebody, but happily in bed with Juno, who's trying to kind of look as seductive as possible. And uh, look at the wonderful Renaissance framework around that, you know, and the, uh, the, the poise of those cherubs beneath, presumably, presumably um, uh, uh, look sort of around, as bearers, around the, the arms of, uh, of Prince Andrea Doria. And so the original tapestries, Philip, 
would have seen mythology feeding into his um, his imagine imagination. And uh, I'll just move on here. I'll just get a fall tableau for a moment, because I'm, I'm stating the obvious, really, stuff that you ob would obviously know that really, you know, he's not the only Renaissance prince who uh, who goes in for sensual sensuous paintings really he's not the only one interested in, in mythology uh in fact at Fontainebleau there's a, there's a whole school of painters there the, the first and second schools of Fontainebleau and the original painters there were were Italians like Prima Ciccio coming over and producing a very a very erotic background for for Francis the first that there, there, there is uh, Francis the first one looks at him and you know and his stuff at Fontainebleau, you can't imagine him really taking such an interest <laughs> in preserving the integrity of Christendom as Philip did. It, it was an obsession with him. And at times Philip couldn't understand why the Pope was playing difficult sometimes when Philip wanted to really, really preserve things, you know, and um, set the Armada here, all that story that you all know about. But there's Francis the first, a different character. And at Fontainebleau, you know, you've probably been there, this wonderful gallery with these paintings, not, it's not just the paintings, but it's the, it's the frameworks, it's all of this nudity, um, where you, beneath this apparently, somewhere beneath that gallery was Francis the first sort of bathroom with, with, with more paintings, erotic paintings down, uh, down there really. So I'm not saying Philip knew this at all, he wouldn't have done, but really this is an, another example of a Renaissance prince monarch really doing his thing. Well, what a poesy. I, I should say that uh, uh, Philip was highly educated. Uh, he'd been taught Latin literature. He knew his, he knew his classical uh, mythology. And uh, over time, he came to own uh, for um, versions or translations of the of, of its metamorphosis really and uh, <clears throat> and these are stories that catered directly to Philip's interest in women and also as we'll see an interest in hunting there's the uh, the palazzo Farnese in Rome and I just want to go there for a moment because uh, Titian was in Rome and very much influenced by the people he met there, what he saw, what he saw of uh, classical, of, of antiquity, the Apollo Belvedere, all of these, the Laocoon, all of these, uh, the, the, these wonderful works of art, even fragments that survived from, uh, survived from, uh, from, from, from antiquity. Um, and here we are at the Plaza Farnese because he did a version he did a version of the Danai for this man here, a great patron of the arts, Cardinal, uh, Cardinal um, Alessandro um, Farnese. Um, so his first Danai we're coming on to, it wasn't for Philip, but for, but for, for this, this man here. And uh, <coughs> it's, um, the picture he did was begun in Venice in 1544, and he completed it when he was a guest of the Farnese in Rome between October 1545 and March 1546, a long, a long stay. In fact, um, in 1544, before he goes to Rome, this painting is referred to as, uh, as almost completed. And, uh, and in fact, um, so my notes in that order, it's um he uh in fact the venetian i think it's the papal nuncio to venice writes to farnese uh making this um this uh this this this, this comment about this painting the the um the, the letter it, the, the painting is described in this the painting is described like this uh, i imagine it would drive the devil the devil up the back of Cardinal San Silvestro, a pious man, and also that he would make the Venus of Urbino 
look like a theatine nun. That gives them some insight, doesn't it, really, into the, um, the play, the play going on between these, these top guys, the, the, these top guys, these, these nuncios and uh, Alessandro and Titian, Titian, uh, Titian himself. And that's uh, a wonderfully um, sensuous uh, painting, really. There is something in there which we take for granted now in a, in a painter, but of course it was quite novel at this point, which is the, it's a portrayal of a, a woman satisfied. The, that look on that dreamy look on her face as uh, she's anticipating this wonderful fall of rain into into her bosom and there's Cupid on the side now Cupid was um, uh, Titian was uh, informing his paintings is a real knowledge of uh, of antiquity uh, when he came back from Rome on one occasion he uh, he, he wrote, I think, in a letter either to Philip or Charles, I'm not sure, how he'd brought some fragments of classical sculpture, that kind of thing, from Rome with him uh, to his studio in Venice. And you, you'll see, actually see in the paintings occasionally these uh, the, the, the items that are inspired by what he's seen and what he's come to possess. And here in the, um, the Cupid there, uh, it's, it's a reference to a piece of sculpture that was in the part of the Farnese collection at the time. He's actually flattering his patron by showing this there in the painting. And there's also a gem that was in, is or was in the Farnese collection of Leda in, and the Swan. There's no, I don't think there's any more uh, erotic um, uh, metamorphosis than Jupiter transforming himself into a swan to have his way with uh, with uh, with Leda, and uh, if you look at her hand, her right hand, the way it's reposing on the fold of the uh, of the of the cloth there, then and then look at the painting. Let's go back there. There's a reference. There's a reference to that gem, and in a way, he's some experts, not me. They think that this is a way his way of flattering. Cardinal Farnese. It's that relationship with, between patron, patron, and, and artist. There, this this we can leave. I'll just say that we the, the painting was just seen was painted on a copy of this. It was reusing a canvas, in fact, the famous Venus of Urbino, which is very much his um, earlier earlier style. Now we come on to the uh, the 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 the, the poesia. In the National Gallery. If you've been to Apsley House, you'll be familiar with this painting, which is one of the stars, uh, always was one of the stars of the uh, of the Wellington collection, and even more now because a few years ago, this was discovered to be the original, the absolutely original painting, which uh, which Titian painted for Philip, and the one in the Prado, a better one actually. Or rather, in better condition, uh, that which which has been thought for centuries to be the original. This uh, that's no longer that's kind of been sidelined. But some some experts still question that. But here we are. We have in England. We've actually got we've got actually we've got four in these islands. We've got four of the uh, the surviving uh, uh, seven seven um, seven uh, poesia. Very, very lucky. There is Danai. There she is, and there is the uh, there's the maid servant. Is she, is, she, is she trying to stop the rain? Is she trying to gather the golden coins? They are gold coins after all. And, or is she just, has she just taken the veil away from Danai? As if she herself was some kind of uh, pro procurist. But, the, the, but this is the first painting done for, for, um, for, Phil, for Philip. And it's, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's the, the first painting you see at the uh, at the exhibition, and that's the Prado version. And uh, the great thing about this one, if we're looking at Titian's style, it's the way he portrays coins falling. It's quite subtle. If you've got very, if you can get very close to this next time you're in Madrid, then look at the coins there. How they are, the, the, the fact that they're the, 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 they're tumbling down and swiveling in the air. That's what he's done. And I remember reading, reading something about how years ago about how Titian had really worked on that face to get the right expression, the right expression 
of acquiescence and anticipated pleasure there. And of course, a little detail of the, of the of little pet down there really as well, which is, uh, in fact, when you walk around the paintings in the exhibition, you'll see that there are, there are animals, there are animals and quite little dainty details as well. You know, um, it's uh, the, the, the sublime, a sublime subject, Virgil on the Tragic, but really decorative as well. Something to be enjoyed, something to be enjoyed over time in your private rooms, in whatever palace you, ha you, you happen to be occupying. I want you to just look at her and then look at Michelangelo's handling, uh, handling of night. Night. Titian probably saw this. Uh, we think he knew a drawing, but look at that for Michelangelo's portrayal of a female, in fact, really. It's, uh, and there's something, I mean, in Michelangelo, there is something of the the anguished the anguished artist in his portrayal his portrayal of of flesh. Uh, Titian moves away from that. Titian is Titian feels free. Titian feels free to move away move away from 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 from, from, from this this approach to the contemplation the contemplation of uh, of uh, flesh. That's something that was brought out by um, by. Um, uh, Lord Clark of Civilization, you, you may remember him if you're old enough, some of you, I am anyway, uh, some years ago, Civilization, in which uh, uh, I think um, Clark says this actually, uh, at every point, Michelangelo's grandiose invention has been transformed from an embodiment of uh, spiritual malaise into an embodiment of physical satisfaction. And remember, this is a, a painting done by a king, a king who uh, went through several marriages for dynastic reasons, had mistresses, I come on to one of them later, and done for a young prince, a young prince, early 20s. This is the first painting he receives, um, he receives from, uh, from from Titian. Uh, I can't uh, help throwing in Matisse because Matisse struggled with this thing later as well, and Matisse arrives at a stage where he he feels free to he feels free to do a sketch like this, where you see his hand with his chalk or whatever he's using, his pen in the foreground, and you see him reflected in the mirror, and you see his latest model, whoever she was, I've forgotten her name, displayed before him, and look how he sums up he sums her up in a few a few sinuous lines, a few uh, lines, lines of beauty. And, uh, and what about this? Here's the latest manifestation of feeling free and easy, really. There is, um, there is, uh, you know, this Tracy, Tracy Emmings bed. Look where we've come to, really. Look where we've come to. <clears throat> the hunt is also uh, an aspect, an aspect of the a the, uh, theme running through running through the, uh, the the paintings. Not all of them, of course, but the hunt. The, there's, there's our hunt with the, the beagles, the beagles going out there. And uh, there is um, Philip IV in the National Gallery hunting. This is Philip II's grandson hunting in the, uh, in, 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 you know, outside Madrid. When you're, when you're in the Royal Palace in Madrid, you look across to the Sierra de Guadarrama, you're looking into, and, and it's even beyond there as well, you're looking into the happy hunting grounds of the Habsburgs, where they pursued a really dangerous sport actually, which was boar hunting. Boar hunting could, 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 could go, uh, go savagely wrong. As Velasquez reminds us, at the foot of this painting where we see a dog on the point of death. And there's Philip IV and his entourage and the, the court and a cross section of society, you imagine, they're watching him hunting. I hope that gives you some idea of that world that Philip also moved in. And uh, this page is directly by Lucas Cranach, a hunt in honor of Charles V and the castle of Torgau. And if, if ever there were a painting where the, the savagery of the hunt was brought out, it's this. In the bottom left, left there, you can see Charles V with his, uh, with his crossroad, 
his crossbow and the landgrave or whoever it is on the left there with his crossbow as well and look at the the landscape look at deer deer being pursued and ending up in swirling pools of water look at the, uh, the uh, kind of ruggedness of that landscape as well you know and the, the engagement of the, of the hounds with with the deer a savage world and as i understand it for a habsburg king i'm just talking about the habsburg not anybody else at the moment for a habsburg king you know to 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 hunt to hunt was a way of practicing if you like for showing mastery confronting danger mastery needing courage you know and there's something of that in the first hunting painting we'll come into in a moment which is the death which is the uh, venus venus and adonis which is there in the national gallery there's a version of this i think which is titian's studio but this is the original from the uh, from the Prado, the Prado. And it shows you the, um, the goddess Venus, who has fallen in love with the, the gorgeous Adonis. Um, isn't there a Lord Adonis? There's a Lord Adonis in the Lord. What a name to have. Lord Adonis is taking the floor, really. Um, but there, there's Adonis. Notice he's wearing a nice red costume. You can't see it, but on the, the band crossing his chest, uh, which will, which is probably holding a quiver behind or something. On there, there's a small cameo. There's a small cameo, and that's based on a real cameo that Titian knew. That's Titian's way of, as a, as a way, referring to this world, world of antiquity, giving giving the picture, the painting, a kind of a kind of depth. Really, there's Venus, and there is very, very female flesh perched perch there and on the and beneath her you've got you've got the uh, the dress the dress that she's just discarded look at that look at that and think of this look how buttoned up costume was for courtiers then and for men men yes as well but but women also there is mary the first there is mary the first maybe at greenwich i don't know with Philip, and uh, that, 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 there they are. There she is. All we see of her body are her, are her hands and her face, and not much of Philip either beyond his face and his hands. When you look at those images again, and I remember at that time, Spanish costume exercised a kind of dominance across the courts. Not total, not total, but a, a big influence really on, on, on style for, for a number of years. And there is Mary, Mary and Philip. And there is a detail of a portrait by Mary. Uh, I think it's by Antonio Moro or maybe Sanchez Coelho. I should have checked this, but, but there she is. There she is. And uh, she may actually be wearing the pearl, the pearl of great price, this wonderful pearl that eventually ended up in the hands of uh, Burton, the actor, who gave it to Elizabeth Taylor. It's one of those jewels that, that, that survived. And there is Mary. And Philip was installed in London with Mary when, the, um, when Venus and Adonis arrived. And look how that painting, as I think they all do, they're certainly for me anyway, they still speak to us. That still speaks to the fear the fear of loss when your partner is going away, going away hunting, going away to war. Look at the noble way he carries he carries his uh, his staff, and look at the dogs. Uh, Titian is brilliant, brilliant at portraying animals, and in this particular one here, he really gives a sense of do of those dogs anxious, anxious to go. One of one of the leashes, one of the leads, is taught. And uh, one, it's almost if the dog on the right senses some prey, you know, senses some prey. Look up above, there's Venus on her chariot. A ray is, a ray is coming from the chariot down to earth to the place where uh, Adonis is going to be killed. And going back to Ovid, he does not spare our feelings. He mentions, he mentions how, uh, how, um, Adonis is gored in the groin by the boar. 
strange juxtaposition of that and the, and, and the beauty and the, the sensuousness of that painting. And it's all Cupid's fault. There's Cupid dozing. Cupid caused this by accidentally firing an arrow at his mother. Yeah. Next. Now, we, we've got to an hour. I've got a bit more. Is, uh, is, I hope that's all right. If Justin, if you can unmute yourself or something and get to me, if you think I should be um, drawing it to, to a close soon, but I'll carry on really unless I... I Hi Paul. Uh, no, I'm I'm happy to hear more if everybody Fine. else. Okay, is. I'll carry on then. I'll carry on. That's Cupid, and the tree there. The tree there. It's it's a reference to it's a reference to Adonis's birth. In the same in the same painting, we have kind of birth and death, birth and death, this, and the title of, of, of obviously of the of the exhibition is love, desire, and death, eros and thanatos they run seamlessly through these through these uh, through these paintings and they culminate in the death of action the painting that philip never 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 uh, never received there we are and there in that thing you can just see that little cameo i was talking about uh, just uh, just now now i come on to diana Diana the Huntress, um, Diana, Diana, the daughter of Zeus and the uh, sister of Apollo, the virgin goddess, the defender of the hunt, the defender of, uh, of chastity, who surrounded herself with a band of, uh, of chaste, uh, chaste uh, maidens. There she is in a, in a statue. You, you often see, this was at Pose and Lacey in Surrey, you often see this up and down country houses and palace parks and so on. It's the famous one of Diana the Huntress. And it's, it's reminiscent really of, uh, of her brother's Apollo, the famous Apollo, Apollo Belvedere in Rome, which is the epitome, the epitome of grace, grace and uh, ideal, ideal Greek, Greek beauty. The, and, uh, and Apollo, he was originally carrying a bow just like her. Look at that bow and arrow. We will see her pursuing Action later with that bow and arrow. And 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 uh, actions hounds. Uh, she was a bit naughty, uh, Diana. Sometimes, this is a an early nineteenth century painting by Giraudet in the Louvre. A very 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 large painting. One of the wonderful galleries in the Louvre, and it shows you um, uh, Diana um, doing a kind of metamorphosis. Really, here she is in her manifestation as Silene, who is the, the goddess of the moon, the moon goddess. It's Diana Silene, moon goddess. And this rather playful boy on the left here, he is the incarnation of a zephyr. A zephyr is a it's lovely light spring wind. He is the wind who has moved the, the, the branches of the tree so that the beams of Diana can come down and caress the gorgeous shepherd Endymion. So there she is. She's breaking, she's breaking her vow. Something that she's allowed to do because she's divine. But with Callisto, as we'll as we'll see, see shortly, uh, is not is not um, is not allowed. So there, there there is Diana. An introduction to Diana, and here is Diana and uh, and uh, Action. And um, when I, when I walked into the the room to see these paintings, and I looked at Action uh, drawing back because he's, 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 he's penetrated this sacred grove, this sacred grotto of, of Diana's at the end of a morning's hunt with his, with his pals. There is the, the, the very image of something in life, unexpected, taking you by surprise, and you are then inexorably caught up in it, really. And you could, look, I don't to be to be so facetious at all, I don't be facetious. Oh, th 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 there is COVID. There is COVID. COVID. What a, what a time to see that painting, really. But let's get back to let's get back to Action, who's stumbled in, and there is Diana on the right, and um, the, um, the, 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 the the this painting was made much of by Kenneth Clark. This and the other one I'm going to show you, 
uh, of Diana with a crowd of girls now, a crowd who got multiple figures in these paintings, made much of by Clark because of the free reign that Philip allows himself here in portraying, in portraying the, fe the female nude in the most naturalistic way. Look at the nymph um, wiping the feet of Diana, really. Think of Duga, think of what Duga does later. And there's other artists showing a girl in a studio, in a room in Paris with a tub, you know, washing in the way you did, you know. And look at the girl on the left, who's trying to draw the veil up to cover, to protect Diana. Look at the look on her face of surprise and looking at her, looking at her, her mistress, see what are you gonna do? In other words, Titian is absolutely wonderful on psychology, on, 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 on psychology, on the motions of the minds, uh, of the feelings. <clears throat> and if I can maybe get a, uh, if I just get um, Diana herself, you know, look at the, the look on that face. There she is, she's been, uh, she's been uh, surprised at her bath. There she is. There she is really plotting her vengeance already, which is to turn him into a stag. Next to her, there is her, am I allowed to say black? I don't know, I'm a bit nervous here now, but there is her black nymph, really. And in Venice there, there were slaves, so Tisha would have, would have had a model for this, but there she is. And uh, Diana is wearing a reference to her moon goddess status. And if I go back, look at the shape, look at the shape of, uh, of the black the black nymph on the right. Notice how the, the drapery over her shoulder forms a crescent. Notice how, how her arms, one arm above Diana's head, one down below, forms a crescent. Again, a reference to the moon and a reference to the, the dark side of the moon. And the moon is changeability, really. And here's Diana, who is, who's suddenly gone from sheer contentment with her nymphs to, to see this guy inter, interloping and the rest is history. Look at the, the column next to her. There's a stag's head up there. And among the branches and the trunks on the right, you've got deer hides, deer hides drying there. And again, a reference <coughs> to his fate. And the dog on the left there, the dog on his left, a faithful dog now, but one of maybe 30 or 40, dogs in his pack. Uh, Ovid gives them all names. They all pursue him. They all, they all do for him at the end. So there is Diana and Action the hunter. And a couple of the, the, the beautiful, the sensuousness of that. Look at the, look at the, the landscape. Uh, there's something so forward looking about that rendering of landscape, which uh, it's like a pathetic fallacy. It's, it's echoing, it's resonating with what's going on in the drama. And look at the exquisite draftsmanship in those hands. Look at the hand, look at his hands, look at his, look at his uh, legs, look at the bits of red there, draw your attention there again to that part of the picture. The dog with its lovely kind of collar, you know, the flowing stream, and look at his foot. Um, when I saw this, I thought I must go home and, and examine my own foot again to see that, yes, the little toe is turning in a bit towards the fourth one, but really look at that observation, that observation of Titian there in that painting. So paintings like this are to be, are to be lived in, lived in, to be on your walls over, over the years really. And notice the way he does water, you know, anticipating. Velasquez would learn from this, of course. Velasquez had access to this, and this informed, informed his painting. You know that. Yeah. The look in those eyes. And now we come to Diana and Callisto, where um, <clears throat> the story here is this. The girl on the left who is slumping down, she is pregnant. Now, I took a girlfriend of mine to see this uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and she, she's got two boys. She said, she said you know, Paul, that, preg that pregnancy there, that looks like it's come to term and things are about to happen. In fact, not long after it did, because we are witnessing the, the, the scene here, nine months 
after Callisto, one of the nymphs, was raped by Jupiter, Zeus, who this time, can you believe it? This is God. This is God. This is the divine Jove. God, this time, he transmutes himself into his daughter, Diana. And Callisto is out one day in the fields and meets Diana. And, uh, and, she, and, she, and she's so flattered that Diana is there with her and approaching her and it's it, it's in a it's in really in, in a in a couple of uh, a couple it's just a verse a couple of lines the uh the, the rape is just described she thinks she's embracing diana and she suddenly finds it's a guy really and it's 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 it's, it's Zeus. of course she becomes she is transformed in her punishment into becoming a bear and her son also into a bear. She is the great bear and uh, her son is a little bear. And there they are up there, up there in the constellations. Diana wants to kind of do for them, but really uh, uh, in the end, Jupiter gets, gets his way and they are preserved as constellations. But Juno is so jealous. So she, she's so jealous. She doesn't want these constellations to dip beneath the ocean, you know, for some reason. So she gets Neptune to arrange things so that they permanently remain up there around the North Pole to disgrace them, maybe, in her view. Look at that. Look at the contrast between Diana's hand, left hand around one of her favourite nymphs, or maybe it's Juno, actually, something. And uh, look, at the, um, look at the rest. Look at the rest of them. Look at poor Callisto, who is absolutely done for. Done for. Powerless. Powerless. But no, this, but, but this is the classical world. This, 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 this is the world. This is, this is to be Christian. We go to that. What about this though? There we are. Here we are um, at the beginnings of this preoccupation with artists, with the nude, and with bathing. This is the most gorgeous Cezanne that was in the um, Royal Academy um, uh, neo impressionist neo impressionist collection. Uh, it may still be there. I saw it a few, again a few weeks ago. A Cezanne there. And um, this, sorry to go straight to Hardwick Hall. But if you know your Hardwick Hall, there in the Great Hall, where Bess of Hardwick entertained Elizabeth, there we have uh, this kind of uh, stucco effect decoration of Diana in her grove. There it is. So the, the myth is here in England. It's a well known myth among those who knew these things really, well, sorry, who, who, who liked this, you know, the, the, the myths, the myths, the, there is Diana. And remember, in a way, I suppose Bess placing that there, she is flattering the Virgin Queen, uh, Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. And there's Diana and Callisto again. And I just threw in this dog. Look at the dog on bottom right there. Can you see it? A little dog down there. From the hunting. This is a neighbor's dog I caught the other day, <laughs> really. How Titian, Titian portrays an animal so well, it's, it's, it's just there in front of you. Sorry. And there is Callisto collapsing. And there's Corbet's bathers. Clark refers to, really, in a way, Titian's approach to the nude at this point, this breakthrough, is anticipating, anticipating, anticipating uh, the realism of, uh, of Corbet. And the landscape. And we come on to Perseus and Andromeda. Now, uh, this is one painting that um, uh, I first saw, maybe you did, some of you, back in the 70s, in the Wallace Collection. It's in the Wallace Collection, and uh, it looked nothing at all. It was really, it was really rather, rather damaged. And uh, the story is that it was in Wallace's um, bathroom, dressing room, for about something like 25 years, and therefore it got damaged with the steam, maybe. But, but no, in fact, researchers have discovered that this painting was given to um, a guy who, uh, one of his, one of his um, ministers, ministers, I forget the name, but this minister had it in a semi-outdoor situation. So it's already already damaged in the late 16th uh, century. And it's, it's exchanged hands, this painting, at least 16 times. 
and traveled to eight European cities over almost 260 years. And uh, it was um, bought by one of the founders of the Wallace Collection, Charles Seymour Conway, later third Marquess of Hartford in 1815. And for a while, it was owned by um, Van Dyck, among others. And the story is, it's a story of uh, Perseus and Andromeda. Uh, he's, it's the hero coming to the rescue of the chained up girl. And there's the monster who is going to devour her. So again, we have here um, the uh, wantonness. Here we have an opportunity for another nude in another position and a bit of color up there, the red, the red of uh, the red of Perseus <coughs> flying around. We think that really uh, Titian was inspired by this bronze bas relief by Benvenuto Cellini. You can see his version of Andromeda there, and you can see Perseus up there above. And remember, Perseus is the uh, daughter of Danae, and uh, at some point, uh, having rescued Andromeda and slain the Gordon before that, he's going to go on and accidentally kill his grandfather by throwing a discus and it goes astray. So the gods get their way after all, you know, Danai's dad is slain in the end. And there is um, a painting by Tintoretto, which we think may have uh, influenced Titian. It's St. Mark. It's a miracle of St. Mark in the Scuola di San Marco in, uh, in, in Venice. Another figure flying out of the sky. What a, what a dramatic thing that is. And look what Titian Titian makes of it, made, 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 made of it. I'm coming towards the end. I'm coming towards the end. The Rape of Europa. Um, I show you this, what I've got shown you here, <clears throat> it's a slight mistake. I'm showing you here this painting, which is in Boston, in the Isabella Stuart Gardner collection. Uh, they can see how, it, how dark it is. And that's how I saw it in 2018. It's one of the stars of the Gardner collection. And there it is on the left, the state cleaned. It was cleaned actually for, for this, um, this exhibition. And I put the wrong, I put the wrong, uh, I put the wrong image up. But um, Europa, she is the nymph who is happily with her fellow nymphs, uh, you know, just walking among the nice, herd of cattle as you do you know a nice evening you know and uh, and then and, and jove has spotted her beauty and he thinks how can i get her oh i'll transform myself into a, a bull and before she knows it and and titian is brilliant at capturing before i know it moment she's on the back of of jove being swept off again to olympus i want to draw your attention to in this painting in particular it's the very uh, it's very modern this is a this is a figure to me, really, on Tracy Emin's bed. Look how dishevelled he is. She is. Look how laid back she is. As if again, she's now ready for the uh, for the moment, really. You know. And look at that flailing red again. Red is a light motif of all of these paintings. The flailing red there in the sky, and the sky again. The way he handles the free handling of paint. The way he handles that. There, there it is. Kind of uh, all of a piece with the with the action and I look at those cherubs up there and first of all no no, no look at the rape itself uh, again a jewel we think that a jewel a jewel in the Annick Castle collection now was behind was behind was in somewhere in Titian's imagination giving rise giving giving rise to his choice the way he portrays the uh, the subject this this is this is a, a boy on a on a sea on, on Capricorn. In fact, it's not Diana, but it's it's again it's a figure being carried off by an animal in the waves, and uh, the figures in the sky. We think Titian would have seen uh, Raphael's um, uh, Galatea in the Farnesina in Rome. These the, these figures here with with uh, with their bows and arrows. So so antiquity and his contemporaries feed into Titian's work. How's that? And uh, if we go back to the little, little, uh, little putto down there, there we are. Okay, time's moving on.
the death of Actium. There it is on a Greek, a Greek vase. Philip. And um, this is not a painting that Philip ever received. It ended up and stayed in Titian's uh, studio. That's one thing I've not looked into, but it's definitely, it's, it's the seventh, but it's all of a piece with the others. And for me, it is the climax of them in the sense that uh, it ends, it ends with uh, the gods, in this case Diana, behaving really badly. It brings the Thanatos, the death theme to, uh, to uh, a climax, really. There it is, Diana, Diana and Action. And there are the dogs pursuing the hapless Action. As, and Titian's caught the metamorphosis, as it were, in process. He's, he's got the head of a deer, his feet are changing into, into, into stag's legs, but he's still wearing the red, the red, the red of, of his garment. And if you got close to this painting, you'd see, you'd see the brushstrokes following the dynamic of the dogs attacking him. And the dynamic also of Diana, Diana launching into that painting, firing her arrow at, uh, at, um, at Action. It's a truly dramatic, a truly dramatic painting. And it just, uh, it's really, it's just redolent with that tragic element we found, we find in Titian. There came a point in the middle of his life when he can change style a bit and change direction. And a tragic, a tragic element in the human condition comes through here. This, 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 this is mankind, mankind really hapless <coughs> in the face, in the face of, uh, of faith. And look also how imbued with beauty that image is. Look at the folds across that gorgeous dress she's, uh, she's wearing. And when you get to see this painting, look at the, uh, the still life of the, um, of that bush there in the foreground. It could have been done by Manet really in the, uh, in the 19th century. I just bring things to a conclusion now. There we are. Actium and Philip. This is the Philip who, not the young Philip we saw originally, this is the Philip of mature years, burdened with, uh, with, the, uh, with what he has to do. You know, he often records in his diaries how uh, it's 10 o'clock, things like this, I've not had supper yet. I've got all this work to do. Somebody's coming to see me tomorrow about this interview, blah, blah, blah. You know, this, the, this Philip who, uh, who uh, for me, Brit still actually, Philip is the black legend, the, the black legend of Philip, you know, Don Carlos, the guy who had his son put to death, you know, put away, then put to death. It's in Schiller and the opera by I've Forgotten Whom, you know, but there he is, Don Verdi, Don Carlos, you know, there's Philip with his rosary beads, something dangerous you don't want to know. But there he is, but there's the guy who, who was the great patron of Titian, gave him free reign, gave him free reign, and, uh, and who also, as well as receiving mythologies from him, received paintings such as this, which is one of those, uh, I don't know, kind of noble, tragic entombments you could possibly ever see there. Uh, look at that, uh, look at the sort of Mary Magdalene figure on the right there. Looking in, look at the eros behind that. It's there in many portrayals of Mary Magdalene and the dead, the dead or Christ on the cross. There it is, coming in there, coming there from the right, rather like Diana was coming from the left on the in the other painting. That wonderful dynamic and that sagging, tragic, tragic uh, corpse. And recall that Philip had this kind of thing there. In his, in his collection. He had a great predilection for all things uh, Flemish. And there is again a, uh, on, the Van der Weyden. And I come to this, the pagan view, the death of Adonis. There the death of Adonis on the left of this Roman sarcophagus. There is antiquity. There's the Greek view of life. There is uh, Ovid. And of course, Philip and Titian, what happened to them? As I do this again. And Titian. This is a painting he was working on at his death. It's in the, 
Academia in Venice, and it was finished by uh, by one of his uh, another painter, Palma il Giovane, and this is the painting that Titian would have had placed on the altar above his tomb in the Frari in Venice, where he became a great star with that famous painting of the of the uh, Assumption, still still there today. There is uh, there is Saint Jerome down the bottom there, Saint Jerome, which is possibly it certainly stands for Titian himself, an old man, repentant. There he is. And as somebody wrote on one website I looked at, uh, to, there for the last breath of Christ, it almost seems really there, there with, uh, with, and with these in this classical niche, think of the, uh, think of the grotto, the structure around Diana, Diana and Callisto. There is uh, a painting done by Titian when he was, uh, something like 80 something. It was actually 1576. And that was the year of a big plague in Venice in which he lost his son, Orazio, and he himself died. Uh, in one place I read that he didn't die necessarily of the plague, but certainly died during the plague while it was going on. So interesting detail to, 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 to kind of, uh, to mention really in the times that we are going through. And what about Philip? There he is. There is Philip with a selection of his wives in that the wonderful sculpture piece, flanking, flanking one side of the sanctuary of the Escorial. On the other, you have his father Charles V with, with, with his family. And there he is. There, there's Philip um, gazing into eternity. And uh, on that note, I rest my case. I'd, I'll now try to unmute you all. I don't know if Justin can do that, but, but I, I'll, I'll just try to get in there somehow. I don't, if I um, no, I, if, unfortunately nobody can mute it. Uh, you can't unmute anybody else because um, right, uh, Zoom had some security problems with people being unmuted rather unexpectedly and saying Fine. inappropriate things. Okay, so they, they decided Fine. that um, people should only be able to unmute themselves. Um, before we come on to questions, if, if anybody's got any questions, firstly, thank you very much for, for that. That was an absolutely fantastic talk, um, you know, really useful and interesting introduction to, to a lot of petitions work that I wasn't familiar with, um, and also a, a great summary of, of, um, of classical Roman and Greek mythology, coincidentally. Uh, which obviously featured in his work a lot, and, and I had no idea of his uh, connection with with um, Philip II and therefore Spain. Um, do, does anybody have any questions that they would like to put to Paul? If they do, then um, you'll need to unmute yourselves. Or is perhaps everybody ready for dinner? It's eight o'clock. <laughs> yeah. I, I have the remains of a, of a bottle of Rioja here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we know much about him, Paul? Was he a family man? Did he have children? What was his full name? Uh, Titian's name, full name. Yeah. Uh, Tiziano di Vecello. Vecello. He had, yeah, he had a family, yes. I mentioned uh, one son, uh, Orazio, who, who worked with him. I, I can't think of the names of uh, any others yet, but yes, yes, he was, he was a family man. Yes, he was, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, did very well, did very well for himself by the standards of the age. You know, he was a he became a top artist and, and looked to, to to have the the Holy Roman Emperor and his son as your top patrons, among many others. You know, that he was uh, he's, he's a star. He, he's absolutely he's up there with Michelangelo and uh, Raphael and Damien Hirst, yeah, and and Damien Hirst. <laughs> Damiano di Hirsti, yes, yeah, why not? Yes. <laughs> Would he have ever visited Spain due to his patronage with Philip II? No, no, he, he didn't go to Spain. In fact, uh, he didn't. He didn't, on the whole, like to travel from Venice. But, but he did. He did for a good client like uh, like Charles and Philip. Yes, you know, he preferred to remain. He liked people to come to him. In fact, you know, and seek him out. Yeah. Fair enough. If you can get away with it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right, well, if, if there are okay. no more... Well, well, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank and, you, Paul. Uh, Wonderful. And now, now I seem to... Now I have to somehow uh, 
get the recording. Uh, Don't worry, it'll oh. it'll stop automatically when you close down the conference. Fine. Okay, and that will. I, I'll now leave that to somebody. Well, we we would later to, to to edit, you know, and whatever. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for joining me, everybody. Bye bye. Thank, bye. Thank, thank you for supporting society. Bye, Justin. Bye. Oh, bye, -bye. Um, Christmas thank party. You. Don't forget the Christmas party, everybody. Before before oh, yeah. we go. Um, so yeah. December the 9th, it'll be our main fundraising event for for this year, as we've been somewhat curtailed as there's been some uh, bug floating around uh so yes please do make a date to join the christmas party where um you'll see david no doubt at the very least uh ad adorned with some uh perhaps titian-esque clothing i don't know <laughs> not me i don't like yeah dressing. let's hope not maybe actually no yeah. i don't like dressing up bye no, no clearly not bye. all right Good night, everybody. Okay. Bye, kids. Bye, kids. Yes, everybody. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Oh, there we are. Hello, I can see somebody. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Good. Hello, Paul. It's Angela. Yes, I thought it was. Yes, I said, I recognise you both. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm struggling. Could you see me at all or just the screen? No, well, we, we could see you. We, we have it set so we can see you just to one side and see the Fine. Oh, that's great then. That's good. Okay. Very much enjoy. You did? Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. It's nice to get some feedback. Okay. Yeah, right. I'd hope, hope to see you when all this is over, you know, when we can all. Get together well, we again. hope to see you too. Yes. I mean, you're very welcome. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll send you an email anyway and keep in touch. Okay. Please do. Please, please do what you're doing. Yeah, sure. Great. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye. Mm. I need to, it's how you stop things, I'm going to be sure, actually.